Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Jamcracker live webcast. Today, we have a very exciting presentation plan. Cloud Commerce, Enable Your Cloud-Based Business Model. This webcast is part of our monthly series. Today, we have Steve Crawford, Vice President at Jamcracker, as your presenter. So let's get started. Steve? Great. Thanks, Tony. And Tony, I just want to make sure that uh, we've got the slides displayed. Yes, I do. Okay. Okay, cool. All right. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Tony, for the introduction. And um, um, let's uh, go ahead and get started. So my name is Steve Crawford. I'm Vice President of uh, Strategy and Business Development at Jam Crecker. And thanks for uh, joining us this morning, afternoon, and evening, uh, wherever your time zone may lie. So we're going to go through three different um, kind of major topics today. The first one is to talk about um, cloud business models, and, and um, you know the, the major premise here is um, you know a lot of people talk about cloud technology and all of that stuff and how disruptive it is. You know our, our major feeling here is that the most disruptive thing about cloud computing is the business model, not the technology itself. Technology has been around for quite some time, now even going back to the to the days of uh, dial-up mainframe services. So that's really not the, uh, the key disruption disruption here. It's what um, it's what cloud is enabling in terms of new business models. So we're gonna we're gonna first hit on that and sort of do a broad brush um, um, perspective on um, how that's affecting in uh, different industries. And we'll go through some examples of um, some um, you know cloud-based business models that we're seeing emerging. Uh, second thing is we'll then talk about uh, sort of laying out the requirements and needs from a cloud business model enablement perspective uh, using a few illustrative um, examples. We'll then talk about what are the key underpinnings of the technology in terms of how you enable that. We'll be kind of talking about the concept of uh, creating cloud marketplaces and um, offering your own goods and services via a service delivery type model, aggregating, building up an ecosystem with third party providers. So we'll, we'll talk through that from an architectural standpoint. And then the third topic is we'll go through some actual case studies. And again, I've pulled some examples from different industries, different types of organizations, different geographies to kind of give you a sense of um, how we're seeing uh, various uh, companies evolve with their cloud-based business model. So with that, we'll get started. And we'll get started with the something that gets talked a lot about uh, quite a bit, which is the you know, the coming of age of hybrid IT. And really the, the notion here is not uh, really that new. Um, we've been in an age of hybrid IT for quite some time. What does that mean? Uh, well, as an example, there are a lot of um, organizations today that, yes, they run a lot of their own IT out of their own data centers. They have large IT organizations. But um, over time, you know, many um, critical things or non-critical things have been outsourced to uh, business process um, providers. Uh, things like um, operating could be as, as complex as, uh, gee, I want to hire a BPO to help me operate my SAP installation um, and have them you know, actually be badged under my organization. You're outsourcing that to that BPO provider. Or it might be, gee, I don't want to go through the 15th um, exchange server upgrade um, I, with, uh, now it's time I'm going to, you know, start uh, transitioning over to Office 365 for my email. So that's an example of moving to a SaaS provider. Or, um, gee, I don't want to buy and operate my own CRM. I'm going to outsource that to Salesforce.com. So, so not a whole lot new here in terms of how um, cloud has been enabling hybrid IT. But what we're seeing is, is it's really moving to the next level, and there's a number of different drivers that have caused that. One is just the whole proliferation of um, cloud-based providers that are out there. Um, you know, going back 10 years or so ago, you could probably count them on, on uh, you know, a couple hands, uh, the number of, uh, of really legitimate um, cloud providers that were out there. Today, um, who knows how many? And, and part of uh, the interesting thing here is that cloud begets cloud, right? So when you saw Amazon, for example, open up their infrastructure services via their APIs and self-service portals and things like that, 
um, you saw a huge growth in the number of uh, cloud-based providers, um, new codes so that were providing cloud-based services. Uh, why is that? Well, you know, the, uh, the barriers to entry for these companies to um, scale up a, a pretty massive infrastructure and to build out services and deliver them, um, that, bar that barrier to entry has, um, had gone down significantly, right? The cost of infrastructure had gone down to, you know, pay as you go from what before uh, might have required, you know, millions of dollars in, in uh, VC funding to build out a data center, install all the equipment, um, hire all the people to run the equipment and things like that. So just one example of how, you know, cloud begets cloud and, and that has really increased the number of providers. The second thing is that um, if you look historically over um, the last decade or so in terms of IT budgets, um, you'll see that the trend has been that IT has, has for quite some time been um, faced with the requirement to do more with less. And, you know, if you particularly look at CapEx budgets, um, you know, in terms of industry um, averages, the uh, amount of CapEx budget for your typical IT organization has been very flat or declining. And if you look at the OpEx budget, um, that also has been very, you know, not much growth there as well. But if you look at what the cost elements are of a typical IT budget, you'll see that a lot of the, that OpEx um, cost is getting tied up in terms of uh, keeping the lights on, um, maintaining existing equipment, uh, existing applications, and things like that. So the typical you know, IT budget model has also been very constrained and will be moving forward. And so I think uh, what we're seeing over time is that uh, as equipment gets depreciated, fully amortized, just uh, applications uh, sort of uh, get a little too long in the tooth, um, that more and more of, um, you know, existing on-premise applications and, and infrastructure are going to be outsourced to cloud providers. And the third thing is that um, um, IT organizations in general are trying to, because they're trying to do more with less, they're trying to get more flexible, they're trying to get more agile um, in terms of how they roll out new services for their uh, LLBs, for their internal users. Uh, because there's still going to be a need for IT organizations, internal developers, to build um, custom applications um, that are mission critical or, or um, competitive differentiators for, you know, the organization that they work in. And then later on top of that, you've got, you know, the proliferation of bring your own devices. You've got the proliferation of um, users that are going out on their own and adopting cloud services. So it's kind of a bring your own cloud. And, you know, see that we're in kind of, a, we're already in a, an age of hybrid IT and that, you know, the whole cloud delivery model, the whole cloud business model is going to continue to drive that, um, that uh, notion of hybrid IT for some time to come. So the other key thing here is, is there's not, um, in our mind, there's not a clear de uh, demarcation between cloud providers and cloud consumers because the way you know, in reality, the way this is, is that all kinds of organizations, or at least most organizations, are going to be adopting a cloud-based model. You're going to have some organizations that are pure cloud, you know, providers uh, in their own right, folks like Salesforce.com, Amazon Web Services. But you're going to have a lot of hybrid business models in terms of how traditional organizations are um, adding on cloud-based business models to their existing you know, license-based models, for as an example. And so, you know, um, every cloud, uh, say every, but uh, to generalize, most organizations that are consuming cloud services are also going to be providing cloud services, um, you know, to their customers. And, and in some cases, they're going to be providing them, you know, the customers are going to be also their cloud providers. Um, so what we're seeing, um, so in terms of the why should you care, in terms of thinking about um, adopting a cloud-based business model, is, is basically if you don't, you're, you're very likely going to get disrupted. And we've seen this across countless industries where oh, you take something like, um, you know, the um, traditional um, taxi uh, industry, right? And it's all in the news now about how Uber is, um, and Lyft are, are disrupting, you know, this traditional industry. Well, historically, um, taxi companies had fairly high um, barriers to, to entry in terms of um, keeping out competition. 
Uh, there's a lot of regulation around this. Uh, generally, to become a taxi driver, you might have to pay several hundred thousand dollars for a medallion. There's the cost of the cars. There's the cost of the infrastructure to operate um, all of those vehicles. And then Uber came along and really with uh, very low um, cost in terms of having to invest in assets has come in and, and disrupted it. And how they've disrupted it, they've really applied a cloud-based delivery model and, um, and catalog model, if you will, around an untapped asset, which was you know, drivers that have their own cars, that have some free time, that are willing to um, you know, um, pick up people and um, take them to their destinations, right? So essentially, it's taking an underutilized asset and applying it to um, you know, a traditional market need, right? That's just one example with, um, you know, with Uber and Lyft, and you can probably think about countless others. So what's the impact to these traditional industries of, of, of this? Well, you know, they, they've always had the, the whole issue around traditional competition, you know, competing with the core services. Now they're having to deal with this over-the-top competition, if you will. So take Uber as an example, where they're able to come in, they're able to build up, um, you know, kind of come in through the long tail, they're able to build up customers, they're able to build up critical mass. But if you look at Uber, they really have very little in terms of assets other than the intellectual property they've built around you know, the, the application um, that they offer up um, to uh, riders and, and drivers. Um, we're seeing this across other traditional industries, such as um, banking, um, you know, all kinds of different things. So, so the key thing here is that if you want to avoid you know, getting your, your existing core services heavily commoditized, running into the issue of declining profit margins, having your customer base churn, losing market share. Um, just like over the last uh, 10 or 20 years, we've seen a, a huge drop off in terms of you know, many of the Fortune 50 um, companies that were around 10, 20 years ago. You know, many of them are, aren't around anymore, at least they're not in the Fortune 50 anymore. And so if you want to avoid being disrupted by others, it's um, clearly you need to think about how you can implement the cloud-based business model into your existing game plan, into your existing business model moving, moving forward. So the type of business model that you adopt is really kind of um, uh, is, is determined by the, the type of business model that you have today. So to run through an example, if you are a software provider, traditional enterprise software provider today, and let's say you're selling licensed software to enterprise IT organizations, and it's the classic model of, um, you know, like an SAP or something like that, um, or even a lower price type of license model. So you come out with releases, you try to get your customers to upgrade, you get the upgrade fees, you, you know, try to get net new customers, um, things like that. You know, very likely what you're running into is that um, the number of new customers that you're signing up is, uh, is diminishing. The number of um, existing customers that are, you know, re-upping their licenses or buying the, the latest and greatest release is diminishing, and as a result, your, your gross margins are coming down, right? But you still have a very large, you know, potentially a very large installed base, right? So you can apply that cloud-based business model to your installed base. It doesn't mean that you have to throw out your existing, you know, licensed software model, um, but you might want to entertain, okay, Great. Instead of um, rolling out new features and, and um, trying to force my customers to buy these big, huge, monolithic uh, release updates and them imparting the cost of going through the upgrade process, you know, what if I release these upgrades in more of a subscription type model, right? What if I introduce new features in more of a subscription type model? Um, what if I, um, you know, offered up um, partner solutions in a, you know, in, in a kind of a unified subscription model, right? So you can see, then you kind of, kind of start moving towards a razor and razor blades type model where you're, you know, you're, you're helping maintain your core base by providing value, by providing stickiness through the subscription model. Um, you're making it easier to, for your existing customers to, to stay with you, right? And um, you're offering some competitive differentiation around people that are, are trying to displace you. And, you know, over time, and we see companies that do this, some more successfully than others, but over time, you know, you may be able to grow your net new uh, market share 
by you know offering a subscription based model around your software offering maybe you virtualize it maybe for certain types of customers you know you you um, have a subscription model you spin up a virtualized instance and um, you know have a metered usage or a subscription type building model and maybe over time you you know migrate your base over to that so that's kind of a classic uh, software example um, some of the others are, um, if you move to the right, the pure consulting model. Um, let's say you're a VAR or you're a system integrator or you're a BPO provider and um, you're providing, you know, the types of services that you do today. There's ample opportunities, obviously, to be, um, you know, providing, to be helping your customers move to the cloud, to be adopting cloud-based business models and things like that. So we see a lot of that with system integrators. Who are um, you know helping their um, customers set up um, internal cloud marketplaces to become cloud brokers, um, helping them think through you know various business models, um, and um, you know other examples like that. Now, if you move to the bottom, um, this is kind of an interesting case because it's um, um, to some extent there's sort of a race to zero that's happening here in terms of um, of margins, and that is. If you're if you're uh, an infrastructure provider today, or if you're thinking about, gee, I want my cloud-based model to be offering up infrastructure services, then you really need to think clearly or carefully on this one. And so the common example we see here is uh, maybe it's a telco service provider, and they sell you know networking and and uh, lines and calls and and uh, you know uh, internet-based services and things like internet. Uh, uh, connectivity services. Maybe they historically have had a, um, you know, a website hosting type of business, and oftentimes we'll see, you know, these service providers say, "Hey, I want to compete against Amazon. Hey, I want to compete against Microsoft, um, Azure." And you know, when you kind of dig down into it, a lot of times it's a pretty thin value proposition, and and certainly it's not going to be a very high margin um, business. Um, by any stretch of the imagination. So, um, you know, so unless you've got some kind of infrastructure as a service capability that is very focused on a particular segment, you know, maybe it's uh, uh, focused on some heavily regulated industry where, you know, the average AWS or uh, Azure or Rackspace type of offering is not really conducive to that, and you can provide a lot of value-added services around that, you have deep knowledge within that market, et cetera, then, you know, it makes sense to compete there. But again, you're not competing on, you know, your infrastructure necessarily being better than Amazon's infrastructure or Microsoft's infrastructure as a service. You're really building your cloud model around the, the wraparound services that you apply around those infrastructure services. So anyway, it's important to think about where, where your value is and how you're going to monetize your value. So some of the key considerations that we see organizations go through when they're thinking about their um, business models is, okay, what are the desired outcomes that I, you know, that I want to have as an organization as I think through my cloud-based business model? And so some common scenarios I hear, um, okay, I want to provide a services marketplace where I can offer up my, you know, my new um, internal cloud services that I've been developing. Um, as well as, uh, you know, offer up uh, complementary third-party services. So uh, an example of that would be, um, oh, it's sort of the, I call it the app exchange model, right? It's sort of, um, um, in this case, obviously, Salesforce already was a cloud provider, but they had their own core offering. They opened up a marketplace for third-party providers who had built value around Salesforce, you know, as a platform. They provide the incentives from a distribution and marketplace standpoint for those developers to come and publish their application services, their application integrations into the App Exchange marketplace, right? And as a result, you know, Salesforce has built a very vibrant um, ecosystem um, and, um, um, you know, helped, um, um, as a result, uh, helped build up differentiation and, and market share of their own core services, right? So that's a good classic example. But apply that to, um, you know, sort of a standard organization. Well, you know, last year there was a lot of talk about, you know, this is the year of the API or the API economy and things like that. And really, you know, kind of an, another example of um, sort of maybe something that was overhyped, but, 
um, in terms of short-term expectations, but very significant long-term um, implications um, is um, is that okay? If you're a bank and you've opened up your APIs um, for different developers to be able to come in and build application services around your banking services and you create a marketplace and that's the incentive for developers to come and publish to that because it gives them easy access to your customer base you're also following that app exchange type of model right um, second key thing is um, okay um, I actually want to bundle third-party services with my existing core offerings so you know maybe you've got um, some partners that have built um, Oh, we've seen this with um, voice over IP companies where maybe they'll have development partners with, who have built, um, you know, speech to text um, conversion engines, you know, and offering them up as a cloud service and, you know, something that's very readily adopted by, by the VoIP provider's uh, customer base. Um, you know, the VoIP provider might want to make that a mainline offering, maybe even OEM that um, and um, offer it up you know, as a subscription-based service to their to their customers, right? So that would be an example of not just offering third-party services side by side, but actually um, embedding them or OEMing them or, or tightly integrating them into your existing core offering. Um, so sort of a variation on theme of the first one. Third one is, um, you know, third benefit of a cloud-based business model is that it can um, offer up um, fantastic um, um, reach um, over the entire life cycle of how you engage with your customers. And so as an example here, we've seen this a lot with um, traditional telco service providers, right? So these are guys, large organizations that come in, they sell, um, you know, voice um, services, they sell internet services to companies of different sizes. But your average employee within those companies has no idea very likely has no idea who the broadband provider is for their, um, you know, for their internet connection. They have no idea who's the um, phone provider, but that end user is picking up their phone every day, making phone calls. They're, they're, um, you know, they're online day in and day out. It's mission critical, but again, they have no idea who's providing that mission critical capabilities to their company, right? Who knows within the company? It's the people that you know shop around and, and buy those services. And as a result, you know broadband and, and telephony services tend to be heavily commoditized. And we see this in the market. Service providers, you know, we see lots of reports about service providers are, you know, laying people off. They're trying to cut costs. What they're trying to do is they're trying to maintain their gross margins, right? And so, if um, so we've seen several cases, and I'll go through a couple of case studies um, later on, but we've seen several cases where service providers said, okay, I want to create a marketplace where I can offer up complementary third-party services and even my own, you know, new core offerings um, to my customers, right? So, okay, maybe I'm a service provider and I want to create a small business, you know, marketplace. And so I'm offering up third-party, you know, providers there. So maybe um, several different email providers, several different uh, web hosting providers, uh, domain names, um, you know, small business uh, application solutions, things like that, right? And so offer those up to your existing customers, maybe offer them at a discount over what uh, they would pay if they went directly to those users. And, you know, and then start engaging with the customer on a on a continual basis through the whole life cycle. So every time, you know, there's a billing statement going out over um, uh, about uh, the telephony services or internet services, start advertising these other services. So as you get users within those end user organizations who are then starting to go to that service provider's branded portal to purchase services or maybe these services have been provisioned um, on their behalf by an admin within the company, but they're logging in, you know, doing single sign-on into these services through the service provider's branded portal, um, you're now, that service provider is now brand, building brand recognition uh, and stickiness with the end users throughout that organization, right? And so now they're driving differentiation, they're driving loyalty, they're driving visibility, not only around the services that, they're pro the new services they're providing, but also the old, you know, traditional core services. And then finally, um, enabling existing and new service channels is a very important consideration in terms of thinking through your business model. 
Um, there used to be, you know, sort of a popular myth a few years ago that cloud was going to kill the channel. Um, that's absolutely not the case. It's not been our experience. Um, there's always going to be um, a need for trusted intermediaries, uh, trusted advisors um, who sit between the um, provider and the end customer, whether it's a bar who's providing, you know, value-added consulting services around various cloud services for their clients, whether it's a system integrator who's helping integrate, you know, a cloud-based service with an on-premise uh, type solution. Um, there's always going to be a role for, for channels, and you should think through that in terms of thinking through your, your cloud-based business model. So then where do you start? And, and generally what we recommend is, is you start with what's the portfolio of services that you want to offer up to your customers, through your partners, um, to, to reach the outcomes that we talked about on the prior slide. And so, you know, the tendency often here is, um, okay, I want to do a moonshot. Um, I want to, um, you know, go from where I am today, which is maybe selling licensed software, to suddenly being a full singing, dancing, you know, software as a service provider. Um, we generally don't recommend that, right? It's, it's um, you want to disrupt your competition. You don't want to dis disrupt your own organization. And, and oftentimes that's what results when you kind of, take that, um, that um, black and white type of transition approach, right? So you've got to kind of think through this. And generally what we advise is you take kind of a phase, go to market um, approach. You start with basic services, so low tech selling, right? So, you know, you've got to think through the capabilities of your existing sales force, um, the incentives to your existing sales force, uh, your existing channel partners, um, you know, so think through, okay, uh, let's go back to the previous example. So I'm a licensed software provider. I sell these, you know, big license uh, deals to my customers. Um, now I'm going to move towards a subscription model for upgrades, new feature enhancements, things like that. So I'm going to kind of blend that subscription model on top of my existing license model, right? That would be, in a, you know, an example of a hybrid, um, you know, traditional and, and cloud-based uh, model. So... Great. So you start with that. Um, you know, you're not freaking out your sales force. You're not uh, uh, disenfranchising your partners. Um, you're not confusing the heck out of your customers. Um, and then you kind of build for that. Um, you do, you know, you, you introduce maybe uh, partner services, um, sort of go down the app exchange model. Um, again, you want to be thinking about partners that add, you know, value um, to your core offering, not just random uh, you know, you don't want, again, you don't want to confuse your, your channels and your customers. Um, and then by doing this, you're setting the stage for downstream go-to-market phases. You walk up the value chain. You can, you know, start moving more and more of your value to this cloud-based delivery model over time. We also recommend to um, offer multiple services across multiple categories. And, and the reason for that is, first of all, you want to have a certain amount of um, critical mass yeah, as you kind of develop a, um, for example, a cloud marketplace or marketplace of cloud-based services, you know, even, um, even if these are add-ons or if they're partner, you know, value-added partner services. So you want some critical mass there so it's not like you do this big announcement, hey, I've got a cloud marketplace and then there's, you know, two offerings there. Um, so you want to have, um, and generally as a rule of thumb, we, we typically – you know, recommend you start with a dozen or so services. And these can be variations on a theme. These can be different offers around, you know, um, distinct services. Um, but, you know, offer some choice. And even offer multiple, you know, even competitive services in, um, in, in the same segment. Maybe not directly competitive, but, um, you know, maybe there's a small business version of a, an accounting solution and then a large business version of an accounting solution. You know, things like that. Um, the other key thing for that is that um, what you think is going to succeed um, in terms of your service portfolio is very likely not going to be the case. Um, and we've, we've seen this countless examples, right? So no matter how much research you put into it, no mat matter how much, um, you know, homework you do, no matter how much customer testing you do, um, when you launch it, when you go live with it, uh, the dynamics are, are such that, 
you know, things that you thought were going to be a no-brainer, that were going to, you know, be big sellers, sometimes won't be. And the little things that you kind of put in there as an afterthought, you know, may turn out to be the big sellers. So, you know, the good thing about this is that, and this is one of the benefits of the cloud-based um, delivery model, is that you've got a fairly tight feedback loop in terms of what's working and what's not working. Um, because you, you, you know, in, in most cases here, you have um, changed the sales cycle for those cloud-based services to be something that maybe used to be 12 to 18 months to something that is, you know, a fraction of that now. So you can test new offers, you can test new partners, um, things that work, um, great, you build on them, you expand them, things that don't work, um, you know, you ratchet them back, you, you, you know, take them out, you revisit the uh, the pricing, promotions, et cetera. And the other key thing is just keeping it fresh, right? So constantly testing new bundles, new service offerings, new partner offerings. So, so as you've thought through your portfolio, then the next thing is to think through what's the, uh, the pricing model, the billing model around these services. Now, if you're aggregating third-party partner services, you know, some that may already be defined for you, um, typically, it falls into um, three different buckets. Um, there will be the classic subscription model that you'll see with uh, traditional software as a service types of things. And yeah, there may be tiered pricing in terms of different volume tiers and things like that. But generally, it's a you know some price per user per month or whatever the case may be. Um, then the next bucket uh, tends to be more of what you see with infrastructure services, which is it's metered usage, so um, you pay as you go to, uh, based on how much storage you've used or how much compute you've used or, or whatever the case may be. And then the, generally the third one is um, it may be a one-time fee, right? It might be a mobile download that you're selling through your marketplace. Um, you might ask, well, gee, isn't that a traditional license model? Well, the key thing here is that oftentimes um, the ultimate uh, billing model may be a combination of these different things. So maybe you're selling a mobile banking app that, um, uh, or some mobile application that in its own right has, you know, some value. So maybe you have a fixed fee for that, but uh, the reality may, is maybe it's actually a kind of a lost leader and you want to get the application out there, but what you're really trying to do is you're trying to sell back-end services that connect through that application to the user. Right, but by getting the user to pay something for the application, you're kind of getting some skin in the game, you know, some level of commitment from the user, um, and that's the classic razor and razor blades type of um, business model. Um, companies that have uh, been very successful with that in the past have been, you know, well, traditional example would be HP in terms of selling printers at a very low cost, and then making uh, making up the margin. Uh, huge margins in terms of the ink that they sell. So anyway, these are the things to kind of think through. And again, it goes back to my earlier statement, which is to think about where is the value that you're providing and, and really kind of price, you know, around the value. Um, and what that may mean is that some of, the, some of the services or some of the things that you're offering up, such as, you know, an infrastructure service or a mobile download, um, you know, maybe the margins on that are... Um, very slim or may, maybe non-existent, but maybe that's how you get your foot in the door to sell your your higher gross margin services um, that you wrap around that. So these are all things to um, to think through. So anyway, we've talked through a number of different, um, um, I guess, considerations in terms of thinking through your business models. We've, we've gone through a few hypothetical examples. I'm going to next talk about um, sort of what's the underlying technology you should be thinking about, underlying architecture, um, types of, um, you know, platforms you might be thinking about uh, either building or buying um, to, to build out this kind of capability. And you've heard me sort of toss around the term marketplace and things like that. So I'm going to delve into that a little bit more. And then, uh, then I'll close off with uh, going through uh, four or five different um, case studies of different types of organizations that we've worked with. So about Jamcracker, we've been in the business of um, enabling um, aggregated services delivery, cloud enablement, SaaS enablement, since our founding in 1999. 
Um, we, um, what we offer up is a, um, um, a platform. We call it a um, uh, variously a, a cloud brokerage or cloud marketplace enablement platform. You know, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about what goes into it. But from a conceptual basis, what it does is it allows our customers to create their own uh, branded marketplaces. So you never see the Jamcracker name. Um, everything we do is white labeled. And um, so our customers can create their own marketplaces. They can create multiple, you know, app store views of those marketplaces um, and tailor those marketplaces for different verticals, different size companies, different geographies, um, you know, channels versus direct sales and, and, and things like that. Um, in terms of the types of services that can be delivered through our platform, uh, we unify the delivery and lifecycle management of, you know, software as a service. It could also be infrastructure services as well. It could be virtualized applications. Um, we even have customers that are offering up hardware with a subscription-based model, you know, through our platform as well. So, you know, customers can come in, they can purchase uh, a hardware subscription. The hardware gets, um, you know, shipped to the user, but the billing model is done through our, our platform. So let's talk about the platform. So this is um, a functional view of the architecture, kind of broken into two different layers here. There's the services delivery layer on the top and the services management layer at the bottom. And starting with the top, services delivery, and we define services delivery as really the life cycle associated with, with onboarding and delivering um, cloud services, cloud-based services to your customers or through your channels and the whole order to cache you know, the um, automation that's associated with that. So, you know, some of the key elements here are, you know, service catalog, and actually you can create multiple service catalogs on a single instance of our platform. Uh, this enables, you know, customers, partners to um, order services in a self-service uh, fulfillment type of mode. Um, we have integration adapters. Um, uh, we have a bunch that are um, off the shelf, if you will, with, um, you know, kind of standard infrastructure providers and SaaS providers. Um, we also provide, you know, tools and, and interfaces for um, our customers, cloud providers to build adapters to our platform. And essentially what these adapters do is, is they automate the provisioning of organizations and users into the software as a service applications or in the case of infrastructure as a service, um, it essentially does all of the you know, standard um, compute, um, you know, start, stop, terminate types of things. And in fact, uh, with the infrastructure integration framework, we're based that on OpenStack, um, both uh, Nova, Cinder, and uh, Neutron in terms of the compute networking and, and storage um, standards. Um, we also include um, AAA types of functions, authorization, authentication, access control. Um, really the, the key thing here is to be able to create policies in terms of, okay, which class of users should be able to view or order services, uh, which types of organizations. Um, in, you know, in my SMB marketplace, what types of services should, do I want to expose there versus what types of services do I want to expose in my enterprise marketplace? Um, how much visibility do I want to provide to my channels? Um, um, how much control do I want to provide to my end user organization so that they can, you know, do this on behalf of their users, um, things like that. Single sign-on, you know, so you get, um, you know, that convenience to the end users, but also probably more importantly, you've got the visibility in terms of who has access to what, uh, which is very important, um, will be very important to your customers from a governance um, standpoint. Um, other key things here, value points are, um, a single point of user and service administration. So, you know, your customers, um, you know, so you're offering up kind of a, your own app exchange type of marketplace, um, you know, so services that are purchased through there. There's a single point of billing for all of the different services from all the different providers. There's a single point of sign-on, single point of access, single point of policy control, um, and also a single point of user administration. So if your customer has an employee that, that uh, leaves the organization. You can simply log into, you know, the platform that you provide um, as a service, uh, the marketplace service. They can uh, delete that employee or, um, you know, um, there are different ways of doing that. Another could be through a directory integration if it's a large customer. 
So anyway, that that uh, user then automatically gets deprovisioned from all of the services that they've been provisioned to, right? So no more scrambling around, you know, by the end user organization to try to figure out, okay, what were all the different cloud services that this user had signed up for? Okay, I got to log in as the admin into all those different services, delete the user, figure out what to do with their accounts. Now you can do it from one interface. So a lot of value just around that. Reporting and auditing, this is important in terms of you as the marketplace operator to be able to, you know, have that feedback loop in terms of what's selling, uh, which services are selling through which channels, which services are selling with, through which, you know, vertical segment. Uh, but it's also important to your customers to have that kind of reporting capability too in terms of um, doing spend management. Okay, how much am I spending on this service? Which users have access to it? Hey, are there any services where you know I've uh, provisioned users and users their provision, but they haven't used it in the last month or 90 days? Uh, great, maybe I can reallocate those licenses. So, um, and then there's the whole governance thing. Um, you know, generally when you're providing cloud services, there will be a lot of discussions around uh, from your customers, especially large enterprise customers, in terms of of how do I enforce my own policies with this? How do I govern this? How do I pass my Sarbanes Oxley audit that's coming up, um, you know, when when this uh, data is sitting outside of my firewall and, and all of that stuff, right? And there's, so there's a lot of, you know, fear and a certain amount of fud around this oftentimes, um, but it is does get a lot of scrutiny, and so it's important that you've got a story for it, and the story for it is actually very compelling, which is you're providing the auditing tools within the platform service, the marketplace service that you're offering to your customers. So they can audit who within their organization has access to what. They can audit, you know, ha, uh, have I have a user provision but they haven't been using it. They can audit, you know, do I have any users that shouldn't have access to a service that, um, you know, that I may have missed um, and need to clean up. So those are key things as well. Um, we have a billing engine, right? So all the different billing models that I talked about, uh, subscription-based billing, uh, metered usage, um, et cetera. We support all that. If you want to create a hybrid model, um, we can support that. And then finally, having a, a single point of support for all of the services that you're offering up to your marketplace is important as well. Whether you're, and we have a built-in help desk, but, but typically what our uh, customers will do is they already have their own help desk, whether it's Remedy or something else, um, but they want to kind of interconnect that with their partner services. So if a uh, help desk ticket gets raised or a partner service that's offered through the marketplace, um, it can get escalated to the partner's help desk, which may be on a different system, um, and do it in a way where the end user, the end customer, doesn't lose the traceability or the visibility in terms of what's happening with that, um, with that trouble ticket. So again, so I've talked about a lot of different things here in terms of enabling cloud business models, but also a lot of things that um, um, sort of uh, build value in terms of uh, providing a marketplace of um, cloud services um, that you can build on as time goes on. The bottom part here, I won't spend as much time talking about this, but in a nutshell, um, you know, if you go back to the, the notion that you're likely going to have a mix of different services in your marketplace. You're going to be aggregating, you know, hypothetically, you're going to be aggregating cloud services from your value-added partners, um, um, but you're also very likely um, going to be building your own cloud services, right? Whether these are add-ons, whether these are taking your existing services, virtualizing them, spinning them up on demand when a customer orders them, you're going to have certain needs that you um, in place here. And so you're going to be building those application services on top of something, and, and that something is generally going to be your own infrastructure, whether it's VMware or, or whether you're building out a private cloud based on OpenStack, um, or it could be um, third-party infrastructure providers such as Amazon or Azure, Rackspace, whatever the case may be. Or you may well be orchestrating different components across different, um, different providers. So orchestration is a key thing. Again, all of the stuff that we've done on the services management stuff in terms of, um, of integrating with infrastructures and service providers, providing lifecycle management around that, we've built on top of the OpenStack um, standards. And, and then so we, we've used that in terms of building out the integration framework 
and then similar to what we've done with um, you know a lot of SaaS applications, we saw, we've also built adapters. So we have an off-the-shelf adapter with Amazon Web Services. We have an off-the-shelf adapter with with Azure, um, OpenStack, native support, CloudStack um, is certified on that, VMware, um, and others as well. So with that, um, basically what this does is it allows you to, if you're controlling both the service management side of things as well as the service delivery side of things, you're able to manage the entire supply and demand chain, if you will, for how you source and deliver cloud services um, to your customers. And if your, your customers um, could be external, um, you know, enterprise customers, it could be external channel partners, or if you're an IT organization, your customers can be internal, you know, LLB um, users. So you can source, um, you know, different infrastructure services from, you know, Amazon, Microsoft, um, your own data center. You can build out, um, and we provide some, some pretty, um, cool tools, if you will, for, for building out application services using a drag and drop interface, or you can um, import uh, Chef or Puppet scripts um, to handle you know, the, um, that side of it. Uh, but essentially what you can do is you can create application stacks, you can catalog them in our service catalog, you can offer them up as a SaaS type of application to your end customers, internal or external, and then have them spun up on demand be able to manage them at the infrastructure level in terms of the you know the compute objects uh, instances things like that but also be able to provision users at the application level just like you would with any other you know software as a service type application so we're pretty unique in terms of providing this um, this um, you know cloud supply and demand chain um, management capability the other key thing here, and I'll, last thing before I jump into some um, use case examples or case studies, um, the other thing to think about uh, is, is you're thinking through your cloud marketplace strategy or app store strategy, if you will, is to think about um, how you're going to segment these offerings and the display of these offerings for different types of customer or partner segments. And the way we've architected our platform is that it's multi-tier and multi-tenant. And what I mean by that is with a single instance, whether we run it as a managed service for you, whether you're running it in your own data center um, on-premise or whether you're running it through your own hosting provider, whatever the case may be, um, you know, where you can create um, different catalog views for different market segments, for different customer segments. So. In this example here, I'm showing kind of a simplistic example, which is, okay, I've got the, this marketplace platform. I'm going to create a, a customer marketplace for my, you know, my direct customers, but I'm also going to create a separate distribution marketplace for my resellers who are selling to small, mid-sized business customers, right? Well, I'm probably not going to have a one-size-fits-all, right? So obviously, from a from a, um, a margin tracking standpoint, you know, my margins can be very different in one versus the other. Um, but also in terms of the types of solutions that I offer up, they're going to be different in one versus the other. I may have, you know, the, the solution I sell to my enterprise customers uh, is probably going to have some differences than the solution that I sell through my channels to small and mid-sized business users. So I don't want to confuse SMB customers, you know, when, it, uh, when they're coming in you know, via a, a channel branded app store and, you know, seeing something that isn't really pertinent to them. And I certainly don't want to be confusing my enterprise customers and having them come in and order, you know, an SMB type of service instead of the uh, the enterprise offering that I want them to, to um, subscribe to. So we, uh, we provide this capability. Another example would be, you know, I want to verticalize uh, my offerings across different, um, you know, vertical segments or across different geographies, um, uh, channels, you know, direct channels, et cetera. So I'm going to now run through a few uh, case studies just to help uh, hopefully drive home in your minds um, how these uh, different um, organizations, and these are just organizations that we've been working through, but obviously there are others, but hopefully this will help you kind of think through some examples. So the first one I want to talk about is CETA. Um, and to be honest, I'd never heard of CETA before we started um, working with them um, a couple years ago. But they're a phenomenal company. Um, 
they are owned and operated um, by and on behalf of um, over 450 airline and then trans air transport customers. So I, mean, I don't even have enough room on the slide to, to list all the different logos that um, of all the different organizations. But you know, you think United, you think FedEx, you think um, you know all the major airlines, uh, transport companies, etc. You know, they are part of the CETA consortium. So what CETA as an entity is is that they are essentially um, an in-house um, managed services provider. They've got data centers around the globe. Um, they offer up you know, traditional MSP, managed service provider types of offerings. But what they wanted to do is they wanted to expand. Um, they wanted to do two things. One is to expand their offerings to also include third-party cloud um, providers that uh, would be useful to their airline um, their transport customers. And they also wanted to provide more of a self-service um, delivering consumption you know, front end on their traditional uh, managed service um, managed services. So in other words, they wanted to kind of apply this cloud delivery model to their existing uh, managed services in addition to aggregating um, you know, appropriate relevant uh, third party providers. So we worked with them, um, built up uh, the marketplace platform. They're actually running it in their own data center. Um, you know, running it under their own brand, and um, you know, doing uh, making great strides with this, and it's helping them really um, grow their business and seeing a lot of uh, good successes with this. Another example um, we talked earlier about channels, and we talked about sort of this myth from a few years ago that you know cloud will kill the channel. Well, here here's an example of uh, where that's not the case. And I believe that it won't be the case. And, and again, I'm moving to a different geography. The CETA was, you know, in Europe, well, actually global, um, but they started out in Europe. Uh, first distribution is based in South Africa. They also service other uh, countries in Africa. They're your um, traditional, you know, um, IT distributor. And, um, you know, the, the traditional IT distribution model is uh, warehousing, pick, pack, and ship, uh, financing services, you know, for, for licensed hardware and software. And you might kind of wonder, well, what kind of play do, you know, companies like that have when within a cloud world where you don't need financing, you don't need warehousing, you don't need shipping, um, and all of that stuff. And I think First Distribution is showing, um, by example, that there is a good role for um, IT distributors in the cloud-based world. And it goes back to the whole notion that, you know, we're not going to, it's not like the market's going to flip this giant switch and suddenly, you know, today people are running licensed stuff and now tomorrow they're going to be running everything on the cloud. It's going to be a transitional model. It's going to be a hybrid model for a very long time, if, if, not, um, if not forever. And, and so what First Distribution is doing here is that they're providing a one-stop shop for all IT needs, um, you know, through their channel partners, right? So if somebody needs, you know, hard, um, licensed hardware, licensed software, obviously they can do that. If somebody wants to distribute in addition to, um, you know, selling licensed software, they also want to distribute um, or resell uh, software as a service, um, they're able to do that. If they want to offer up infrastructure services, for example, Amazon Web Services, first distribution is the first uh, channel provider for AWS in, in Africa, um, they can do that. And we're enabling that through our, our platform. So again, an example of how um, cloud business models relate in the um, in distribution uh, types of scenarios. Um, I've mentioned telcos a couple times. Um, you know, it's a market that we've um, traditionally been very strong in. Um, Again, I'm, I'll continue my, my geographic tour here. Let's take a stop off in the Middle East. Um, so this is a uh, customer we have in Saudi Arabia, Mobile. Uh, they're the second, first or second largest, I think they're the second largest um, telecom provider in, um, in the Middle East. We're working with them initially in Saudi Arabia. And what uh, Mobile is doing is they're wanting to provide a, a catalog, um, service catalog of um, complementary infrastructure and software as a service providers um, to their um, to their customers within Saudi Arabia. They sell both direct, you know, to large enterprises and governments, our government agencies. They also sell indirect 
um, through channels to S and B's, um, and yeah, as an example, um, what, one of the interesting things with uh, Mobiley is that in addition to aggregating these services, they're also doing some very interesting things in terms of bundling um, third-party services with their own core offerings. So a lot of experimentation in terms of you know providing a small business starter kit that's got you know broadband, telephony, and you know, email and basic security services and things like that, and offering up as a you know attractive price bundle. Um, another interesting thing that uh, Mobile is doing is that uh, they're also using our platform to offer up infrastructure as a service. Now, as it turns out, in Saudi Arabia, the the regulatory environment is such that there is a play um, for people other than Amazon and Microsoft to offer up um, infrastructure services. And um, so, you know, Mobiley is doing that. Um, but they're not just stopping there. They're also using that as an incentive to um, kind of recruit developers to come develop applications on their infrastructure environment to tie it into the Mobiley services, mobile and, and fixed line services. And then, you know, with the incentive of, um, you know, hey, Mr. Local Developer, if you, you develop a value added application, um, we w that um, you know certify and all that stuff. We will publish it to our marketplace. We will offer it up to our Saudi Arabian customers. We will become your channel partner, in addition to your um, technology provider for the infrastructure services. So again, a good example of how they're you know kind of providing the ability to build out an ecosystem around their core services. Another example, uh, Panasonic. The unit that we're working with is. Um, is the unit that builds uh, ruggedized flat panel devices. And uh, these are, are types of devices that get sold into the military, they get sold into oil and gas, uh, utility, um, things like that. So, you know, chances are if you see a guy walking around with a hard hat and boots, um, uh, he's got a flat panel device, uh, it's a very good chance that it's a Panasonic ruggedized um, device. And so what Panasonic, uh, what they wanted to do is they wanted to provide incentives for third-party developers to come in and build uh, verticalized applications that worked you know, very well with the Panasonic uh, uh, flat panel devices. And so you know, I've mentioned three or four different vertical markets that they sell into. On top of that, um, they have different operating systems that they're building these platforms, these devices on. So some run on Android, some run on Windows. So you can see here that a single app store type of model doesn't really work, you know, wouldn't really work for Panasonic. And so what they wanted to do is they wanted to create lots of different app stores that they could tailor for the different um, operating systems, the different types of devices, and the different uh, verticals that they were selling into. Um, so again, this has been a very successful initiative for Panasonic. Uh, they've built up a very healthy and vibrant uh, developer ecosystem. And again, just like with Mobiley, they're acting as the channel of distribution for these uh, developers by offering up you know, these services through the appropriate app stores to their end customers. And then finally, I want to talk about um, um, kind of a, a different mindset around business case, which is an internal IT organization. And we're really seeing this as being um, a very major transitional thing that's happening with IT organizations, um, you know, across the, uh, across the gamut, across the globe, across different verticals. In this particular example, I'm, I'm choosing a, um, I'll just say it's a very large automotive parts uh, manufacturer. Um, they're a multinational, you know, multi-billion dollar um, company. Um, they build lots of uh, pieces that go into um, brand new cars. They build lots of pieces that uh, those of you that like, like me, that like to work on their own cars, um, you've, you've bought a lot of their products. And so what uh, the IT organization, what their main driver here was, um, you know, they'd seen a lot of, uh, they were experiencing a lot of um, classic descriptor shadow IT, a lot of um, um, kind of um, their internal organizations, internal users, you know, sort of subscribing to cloud services under the radar, you know, without the visibility of the IT organization. 
And this became a, a, a big concern at the executive level, which is how are we ensuring that we have the proper policy and governance and security around this and, and, and do it in a manner where we're not stamping out innovation, right? We don't want to come down with a, uh, and stomp on the LLBs for innovating with, um, you know, different services from different providers, but by the same token, we want to, you know, um, balance the risk in terms of exposure that we have to the organization. So their key driver here was around governance. So again, this whole marketplace, in this case, it's an internal marketplace. They're consolidating all of the different services that have been bought individually by the LLBs. They're standard, they're working with them to standardize on them. You know, so instead of having half a dozen document collaboration services like Box, Dropbox, you know, SharePoint and Google Drive and all that stuff, they're, you know, working with the LLPs to help try to standardize where they can, you know, onto one or two different providers. And then by publishing those providers to an internal service catalog, you know, making it known to other users who need to do document collaboration as an example that, hey, here's a sanctioned service, we've vetted it. Um, you know, um, we put policies around, you know, how you can order it um, and even, you know, laying the groundwork in terms of doing a chargeback model um, and things like vendor management, right? So instead of uh, five different LBs having five different contracts with Box for document collaboration, they're now able to consolidate all of that under a single vendor management organization and get better, you know, a better deal on behalf of, of the organization. So in this case, you know, every, I guess the net net here is everybody's got a business model. Every organization has a business model. Talked a lot about, you know, B2B business models, but there are also internal business models. And that's what we're kind of talking about here in terms of the internal IT organization. Their business model is to provide technology services and support for their internal end users. And it's a great example here of how they're using that cloud-based delivery model to um, improve how they're servicing their internal customers. So with that, I think we're at the 